Okay, Happy New Year. I just wanted to put this video together. I was listening to Roseanne Barr and Juan Osaban on Jennifer Mack's channel and some of the things that he has to say about the Phoenix um, and also about um, where they're trying to take us and different interesting things that kind of correlate with a lot of my work. So I wanted to put that together. I also wanted to talk about the cube, um, the Pentagon star and the um, five... Um, conjunction points with earth and the dates of those and how relevant those are and um, just um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the White House photos that I've been commenting on and getting actually comments back so let's get into it. Okay so I've been commenting on the White House photos and he actually returned one of my comments which really um, verified that I'm on the right track and it was about the vagus nerves um, and uh, the penile gland and you can see in this photo he's taken an evergreen tree and a dead tree and he commented on it and uh, that's my comment was that's what he was referring to it's about ascension a lot of his photographs are about ascension once you understand the symbolism I put the vagus nerve upside down so you can see it actually looks like a dead tree he also took this photograph in there, and if you look really close, there's an X and a skull. And, you know, that would be like, ah, that's like, you know, the um, skull and bone symbolism. But it's actually uh, chromium, um, which actually turns into a rainbow. Um, and you can see the symbolism is also a skull with wings. So this is an ascension symbol. And also it's the periodic uh, number 24 element. And also here we have the pine cone, which represents uh, the penile gland. And you can kind of see it in this graphic that it also looks like an evergreen Christmas tree. And this is all because of fractality. Fractality is what creates our universe. If you listen to Dan Winters, he's really, you know, amazing scientist that discusses all this um, and how this is all going back to golden ratio. It's the, the fractality of our DNA. When you look at it from above, it's a rose. And this is how things heal in this in this kind of fractality symbolism. Um, not sure I can get really into the science of it all, but the symbolism of the penile gland is also fractal like a pine cone. So this is really important. So then William Moon did this weird post about moldy bread, and it happened to be on the December 23rd date, so I commented on it, and he liked it. So that was cool, too. So all this is all about ascension. And, of course, the sun being in the Golden Gate and Mary's heart, you know, you have to have your heart open to ascend. So, yeah, he's right on track with everything. Okay, I'm going to put uh, Juan on with Roseanne Barr, just a few little clips, and uh, they're talking about the phoenix. And he's talking about, you know, the ashes burning and the whole new system um, coming up with the globalists, you know, coming out of the ashes and creating a whole new system. It's, he's talking about it as being like they want to create a new system um, out of the ashes. But for me, I'm focusing on, you know, what is the ashes, first of all, like what's happening that they can create a whole new system out of the ashes. Um, he, of course, he's not going to talk about that, like Ascension, because he can't. It's Basically, it's for us to figure out. But he's, you know, he's bringing up the symbolism a lot. Um, he's also um, talking a little bit about um, Washington, D.C. being an occult city. You know, so he's, he's, he's kind of like slowly bringing into you know, the occultism and, you know, you can see it as like, oh, it's all evil and that's crazy. And we have to, you know, uh, you know, um, to be terrified of all these symbols, but these symbols represent something, right? So why are they so powerful, these symbols? And what does that mean? Are we supposed to fear these symbols because of um, the people using them? Or are we supposed to understand the symbols and then use the power of the symbols for us? Okay, because it's all an illusion. Everything's an illusion. So I'm just trying to make you kind of see it from a, a different point of view so that you're not always in fear of everything and that we can kind of learn um, what these things mean and then use it to our advantage to find freedom. Well, and you know, let me, let me just, you know, the article that I'm mentioning is about uh, misrule um, mm -hmm. and the king of misrule. Uh, I actually... Well, it's all, it's all about... Uh, a group of people who've been in control of the world forever, right? Well, it really is, because it's the same crowd. Mm -hmm. They keep changing their name. You know, uh, in ancient times, we knew them as the Egyptians. 
uh, they were at Troy, they were at uh, Rome, um, and they keep changing their names. That's the, why they have this phoenix. They were in green. Mythology. Yeah, they, they keep reinventing themselves and rebirthing themselves out of the ashes. And so you think it's something new. It's the same crowd. Just Is that why they have the index? index? Yes, because uh, they keep reinventing themselves, rebirthing out of the ashes. The yeah, ashes that they create when they burn down something, a yeah. country. Uh -huh. yeah. I get it. Yeah, and of course, that's why, you know, uh, in past times they went by Caesar's name. Uh, uh, they used other, you know, pharaoh names, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, in modern times, they might be presidents or kings uh, uh, and, of course, kings of industry. In one era, they're um, Morgans and, and Rothschilds and Rockefellers, and now we're going to get to know them under new names that uh, you... But they're always the aristocracy. They're always the aristocracy. They're always the aristocracy. They're they're always the same people. They're always little pharaohs, right? Well, they're they are. They have a bloodline, right? Right back exactly. to the pharaoh. They are the same bloodlines over and over, uh -huh. and they know who they are. In fact, you know, uh, Bill Clinton, um, he said that the person that made it possible for him to become president was Carol Quigley. Oh. Quigley had written this incredibly long tome of a book. He explained how he has gone behind the scenes and looked at all of these bloodline families that rule the world and yeah. explained that to Clinton. And so he understood his history. And, uh, yeah, that, that's important yeah. to understand your history. This article, and the reason I'd, I'd love for people to, to read it, and you know, give their comments on it. It's about the uh, season of misrule, and what that's about is in Rome uh, at the time of Christ and, and thereafter, and many years before. They had this midwinter Saturnist festival. Uh, they were Saturnists, and a lot of people don't know even the Nazis were Saturnists, and so right. and so were the Hellenists, right? Yes, uh, prior to that, uh, these Hellenists, uh, same club. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying it because Hanukkah's been in Hanukkah for my reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. The reason this is important is because uh, in Rome, the most important holiday of the year was the Saturn Festival. In fact, just to give it an idea how important Saturn and the Saturn Festival was to the Romans, the Temple of Saturn was also the treasury of Rome. And so all the coins from Rome were printed in the treasury. And for Christians, for example, when uh, uh, there was a question brought to Christ uh, about whether or not uh, Christ paid the taxes to Rome, and uh, Christ said, well, bring me one of the coins of the realm. And so they brought him a coin, and it had a picture of Caesar stamped on it. And Christ said, uh, whose picture is this? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. And he said, well, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And give unto God that which is God. This coin of the realm, this money of trade, this temple of Saturn was uh, their religion. Go look at your dollar bill. Go look at your 20. Go look at your 100. What symbols are printed all over that money? It's the same crowd, the same club with their little secret handshake imagery and tattoos all over it. You're carrying the talismans of their religion, the symbology of their religion with you everywhere. You're doing every transaction of your life. You're converting your life energy into a piece of paper. And the high holiday of the Saturn religion is the season of misrule at the midwinter, uh, winter solstice. So that's the shortest day of the year. This year it's uh, set, or December 21st. And, and the longest night. And so from a religious standpoint, Roseanne, this is, uh, of, you know, we look at the Q operation, dark to light, the darkest day of the year is going to be Saturday.
the 21st. And there's this belief, because if you track the motion of the sun on the horizon, it looks like it hovers out there for a period of days. Uh, some people call it three days, some people call it six, before you really see it returning visibly in the markers and coming back, and, uh, and the days beginning to get noticeably longer. And so we're in that window right this second. Do you see that the impeachment took place at the beginning of this three days into the longest night of the year? And we're going to have this hovering with all these questions. They're doing this ritual at this most holy time within the religion. Remember, Washington, D.C., every monument, every building, every street, all of the layout is dedicated to the Brotherhood of the Snake. It's all about this religion. And people don't realize that Washington, D.C. is a religion, the way it's practiced, all of that governance. And it's the same religion that was there all the way back to Rome and before with the Saturnists and all the way back to Egypt. And you see this repeating symbology over and over and over. And the most important festival to these Romans, to these Saturnists, is the season of misrule. Okay, so we've got William Moon focusing on the dates that I've been talking about during the winter solstice. Now we have... Juan Osovan really focusing in on Saturnalia, the week of the winter solstice and Christmas and everything. And they're bringing this to our attention so we understand what this means. So you go and do the research, try to figure out what this means. And it's the it was the golden age. He's also talked about before that's when the veil is very thin, when it goes down to, you know, they can get down to zero point. Um, and so this this time period is when this whole ascension uh, process will take place. Okay, so I just wanted to like really get that, you know, home and to understand that this, there's a big event that's going to be happening and we can't change this event. This is like part of our history. It's a reoccurring thing. They keep, you know, rebirthing themselves. And you've got to remember, Christ did rebirth. He did ascend. So this is what he was trying to teach us, and um, this is my belief. And yeah, so here we have um, uh, seven one. He's a gematria guy. I love his work. In you know, it's kind of dry. He doesn't get into too much of the stuff except the numbers. So if you're not into numbers, it's kind of hard to you know really get into. But he's talking about the magic square here. It sums up to twelve twenty five. Also, you know, this five pointed um, Rosabella. Um, pentagon star shape that Venus makes and I've explained this in my other videos um, it has uh, you know five different um, conjunctions to it and these are very important and they all the last um, conjunction happens and then the first one for the next time of the five uh, conjunctions starts at the spring of 2025 right on Baron Trump's birthday and that is you know, the 33rd Pentagon from um, the founding day of the United States. So this is all being programmed out um, so that these this event happens specifically to um, the dates of the founding of the United States. Now he's doing the gematria with, um, you know, the Bible and the 8, 11 um, revelations, you know, which is when Jupiter comes... Um, uh, wormwood and but he's coded all this now he's got the numbers three two five here mirrored back of each other five two three that comes to eight four eight and this is coordinated into the space needle you know we've talked about that in my last video how that's part of the not good eclipse line that went through that area um, in 2017 okay so this number five two eight is the minutes of eight point eight hours uh, the number 88, you know, breaking down to 44, which happens to do with time and the toroidal field. But it also comes out to the five-pointed star and the six-pointed star and the angles, 240 and 288. Um, and then we have the pentagram of Venus. And I just wanted to show you the transits of when they conjunct here. I'm not going to read through it all, but you can kind of see, you know, sometimes you can see the you know conjunction and sometimes you can't 
Um, and this is all being, you know, very uh, important in ancient times where they were using that pan and holding it up to Venus um, to figure out when the 8.8 .8 window was that, you know, I calculated it was around um, Baron Trump's birthday in 2025 when he's 19 years old. So this is kind of explaining it all, just kind of letting you kind of get a grasp of, you know, what the conjunctions are when it's in front of the sun and when it's behind the sun. These are the dates again, the years of each uh, conjunction. It takes um, eight years for it to complete and its conjunctions are with Earth, right? So here's the uh, magic square of Venus. This is really interesting how these numbers all end up coming down to seven. So the gematria of 175, which they all add up to, the rows, the columns, the diagonals, is uh, 13. But uh, the numbers are associated with 7, 49, 175, and um, 1225. I started calculating it all out with the dates um, of when the conjunctions are. And you can see here the gematria all comes down to um, 777. You can see if you take um, 1225 and divide it by 49, it comes to 25. And that's the start of the Venus pentagram, um, the 33rd pentagram in uh, the spring um, equinox on Baron Trump's birthday, 2025. And we're back to the very important number of 311 and 911 with the gematria of uh, the March 22nd date. You can go watch uh, one of my videos called The Expert, all about Baron Trump's birthday being on the um, retrograde of Venus before it goes into the last, uh, well, the first uh, 33rd uh, pentagram after the foundation of the United States. So it's like he's going to be 19, this Venus conjunction is happening, um, and uh, the start of the new pentagram. So it's like a whole new brave world starting with this new pentagram. And it's been all calculated to precision for this event to happen. I just wanted to show you where exactly they were, like this is in Pisces, this one is in Virgo, uh, then it goes to Taurus, um, when, and then uh, the Sun, this one, the Moon is really close to it, and it's right on the Reg uh, Regulus um, star, which is in Leo, super important, um, and then it's in Pisces again, so you can see, you know, how it's done its whole circle, it comes back to Pisces. It's interesting that it ends in Leo on Regulus, um, which is what the Sphinx is pointing to, that points to that star and it's built to point at that star. It also so happens that uh, Baron Trump's birthday, Baron Will I Am, Will I Am birthday is on March 20th and on that year in 2025 it is the spring um, equinox which is the beginning of birth right um, of the new year which was when calendars uh, used to start so you can see this is a whole new beginning so exactly um, nine days later um, there is uh, an eclipse right on the Sun um, with the Venus uh, conjunction there and it happens to be on Pegasus's back, on the horse's back. So we have symbolism there with the, you know, the horse and the new beginning. Okay, I want to get into the cube symbolism a little bit now and what all that means, uh, the Jerusalem cube. Okay, so you can see here there's Bible quotes all about the cube. And there's people that are really into gematria that have, you know, taken the measurements in the Bible and create, and it does come to a cube. I've listened to very, uh, quite a few Gematria people and explaining it all. It's quite fascinating that this all comes down to a cube. And I think for me, it's basically a Tesseract. It, what's a Tesseract? A Tesseract goes into fourth dimension. It goes into another time period. So you can look into all these numbers and decipher them and kind of get a grasp on um, what the symbolism is uh, for the cube. But it's also being in many videos, you know, you got your Xbox and this music video with Will I Am again. Um, it's all about Saturn, uh, the black cube, and the gold cube. So it seems like there's two cubes. Here's uh, Justin Bieber, and he can see that, you know, it's all about the power, the power, and the fire, and he t basically ascends. He goes into like a hologram. You also see that these two upside down Vs, which is uh, feminine. It's, it's actually the divine feminine, which is Venus again. 
It's also um, Cassiopeia, the, the queen of heaven, her, her uh, constellation is a W or an M up the other way. So we have the symbolism there. Here's some of the lyrics. I'm going to take it higher and higher and higher and higher. I stay and buy a tire, keep burning like that fire. So it's all about, the Kundalini is all about being able to take on this fire, okay? Being able to transform yourself out of the ashes to ascend, to come into a totally different reality of the golden age. And I don't know if you looked a lot at what I had put up when Juan was talking and it was all about Trump's inauguration. It was all aligned to the Sirius star. Okay. There's no doubt in my mind that it was all done specifically to that time. And you know, people go, ah, it's satanic. Eh. No, it's what it is. It's power. Okay. Because when you align yourself to the sky, you are, um, you know, in alignment with God, you're basically in alignment with the greater, um, mega, universe right so um that's all done to create power okay so the sirius star is isis which is the queen of heaven which melania represents which why it was all done like that the whole dance and everything in his inauguration so um it's just trying to understand it but I, i've been kind of like tracking sirius on these dates around the winter solstice to see and i've you know really got blown away because it creates a cube with the winter hexagon. I'm going to explain all that. Now, the whole fascination with Sirius is because it relates to um, the, the River Nile, okay, um, in Cairo. And around July 19th was the beginning of the calendar. Um, there was a, this, they were watching it because it, it was, you know, created life for them, the, the, the river. So when the river flooded, it was a problem. When it went dry, it was a problem. So Basically, they were always watching this dog star, it's called, right? Um, and, and calculating, you know, the dog days of summer were coming, the, the heat and, you know, the crops, you know, weren't going to get water, whatever. It was just, they had this fascination with this star. Okay, so right at this date on July 20th, Sirius is rising. It's the heliacal rising because it's on the east. It's, it's coming up when the sun um, arises. Okay. It's in conjunction with it in a way, because it's coming up at the same time. Um, so you can see this creates kind of like a kite. It's like a box kite, but what's fascinating when the winter hexagon is the actual six sides. Um, there's a little gap over here where the Gemini, it's like they use the two stars there. So there's a little hole and this brings you to cancer. Okay. Now cancer, I'm going to go into all this. It's like, it's crazy. This is actually the manger. Okay. This is what it represents. And it's a triangle there attached to the cube. Now the top of the cube has the, the God's hammer right in the center of it, right? You can see the hammer. It's right. Um, the Orion hammer. Okay. And so right at the, the joining of the Y, the yellow Y is right on the horse's mouth. Like don't look a gift horse in the mouth. I guess that's where that saying comes from. That happens to be the Rose Nebula which I'll show you what all that's all about. Right at the circle of where the top of the, the hammer is the biggest black hole they've ever discovered. Right at the foot, the left foot of um, Gemini. It's called uh, LB1 and I'll, I'll go into that. But I was just blown away by this winter hexagon and the importance of it and the fact that it looks like a kite. It's just like, ah, I couldn't believe it. Now the tail of the kite goes down to Canopus and Canopus, you know, if you've watched my big long video there about the Maga Mother, um, the Twilight Zone, that is actually the magnetic um, soul, uh, South Pole star. Okay. And that's right in the ship. So that's why it's connected. The kite is connected to that um, star and that's what creates the harvest. It creates the, um, the vacuum. There's magnetic clouds underneath it. There's a constellation above it, the ship that represents the vacuum, um, the, you know, which is going to create this wind tunnel for the harvest. So yeah, it's all connected to the big giant cube, the kite. And of course it being like Christmas, I kept hearing the song. Do you hear what I hear? You know, uh, said the night to wind to the little lamb. Do you see what I see way up in the sky? Little lamb. Do you see what I see? A star, a star dancing in the night as, with a tail as big as a kite. So this is where all that comes from. Okay. Okay. So right at the horse's mouth, exactly. You can see it right here. 
um, is this beautiful rose nebula. I showed you this before and I didn't really catch on that it was happened to be on the Y of the cube. Like I just knew it was in the hexagon, but I didn't understand why. And then you have the whole Rosicrucian with the rose, right? It's all the symbolism for that specific spot. It makes sense. It's right on the corner. Um, I also saw William Moon doing some shots with, you know, right on the corner of some of the White House buildings. And, you know, I was wondering, what's this corner, the angle, the corner? Um, you know, so it's the square in the Freemason symbol. It's the square in the circle, in, you know, in the compass. I'm sure it has something to do with that as well. Okay, so let's get back to this kite here again and this black hole. I was fascinated when I saw in the news they were talking about this black hole. Just recently, scientists have discovered a monster black hole that is so big it shouldn't exist. Did you catch the date? November 29th, 11-11. Who sees 11-11? I do all the time. So scientists are now scratching their heads at how LB1 got so huge. I just find it fascinating that it happens to be right on the hammer of God. So they give the coordinates here of the right ascension and the declination. Um, so I figured out where exactly where it was and it's right on the foot of Gemini. So now they're saying that there's two types of black holes, supermassive black holes are at least a million times bigger than the sun and their origins are uncertain. So yeah, it's it's all speculation, but it's pretty crazy. Um, we'll see what happens with that. So I just wanted to give you a close-up shot of it, where you can see it's right on the bottom of the foot. Here's an old picture where they have the um, horse with the with the unicorn, um, Mono Sirius constellation. Um, it has a snowflake cluster. It has a fox fur nebula. I know it also has a Christmas tree nebula. So it's all kind of pointing towards the winter solstice um, symbolism. So 7-1 and his gematria, you know, has the radius of the earth um, and then 24 times 24, which has to do with the 24 um, star number. You can see all these numbers correlate to the whole dimension of the planet um, and how they're using those dimensions and part of the symbolism. The other Gematria guy I listened to is Whiteboard Gematria. He's calculated the whole cube with, you know, the six and the seven and the flux capacitor, which was in um, Back to the Future, the Y being that. You have to listen to this. It's really fascinating. We got the 88 is the cube again. So these numbers, they, they just keep reoccurring over and over again. And it seems like the cube is really, you know, the whole thing that all the symbolism is all about. Now I'm just kind of figuring out if there's a winter hexagon has a cube. Also, the summer triangle has a cube, which is Cygnus. Okay, so there's two cubes. So this little triangle that goes off of the cube that has a little space in it, um, is the constellation uh, Cancer. Now Cancer, um, the, the front between Cancer and Leo is the Lion's Gate, um, you know, the last gate. You've got the Silver Gate, um, which is between the horns of Taurus. You've got the Golden Gate, which is at the Spear of Sagittarius, and then you have the Lion's Gate. And now the Crab, I, I when I started really looking into it, I couldn't believe the importance of the, you know, the spring, um, well, it's not the spring. It's the summer sol. It's the summer um, uh, solstice. Um, so it's like, yeah, this is like super, super important. Um, this constellation, and when you start getting into it, it relates to Jesus and the manger. So I want to do a real close up here of Cancer. You know, like it has like the two eyes. That's actually two donkeys, and then Tegman, which is at the back end of the crab is um is like the cover it's like considered the cover i was actually born on there so it's kind of like it's kind of funny it's a it's a bad joke right i'm born on the butthole so I'm, it's pretty funny now right between the two donkeys like the two eyes of the crab is the beehive cluster it's called pes pesicep uh pes i'm not pronouncing that right but anyhow that's the manger that little cluster there um and this is what the ancients believed right that's what they they were always looking at the sky this was really fascinating when I found the meaning of the Arabic name Khan, um, meaning in, okay, so encircling, um, uh, fortified home of travelers, uh, 
multitude believers will be gathered in the heavens, okay? So the sheepfold, uh, so the assemb assembly, the church. So that's what this means is that whole constellation, the holding place. So I'm like the con, if I had done this before, uh, talked about Marikan, it's the Amur, um, is the Lemuria and Khan. It's like you got like Atlantis and Lemuria. It's a la America, a for Atlantis and Amur is for Lemuria. And then you got the Khan. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, everything's named around this whole, it's all, everything's named around the constellations. It blows my mind. Like when you start really digging, it's everything is in the sky. Okay, now it used to be a beetle, the sacred beetle, it's scarab, um, and that speaks of resurrection. So here we go again. And lastly, the Argo, the ship, uh, signaling the redeemed pilgrims taking safely to their home. Yeah, the Argo ship uh, brings you to home because that's where you get harvested. But the other way is where you ascend, okay? So you just kind of like you get reborn into something else. Um, with all your memories. So it's like, it, it just depends on what your beliefs are and where your soul really wants you to be at this point in time as this window opens. So they're saying here, yeah, the crab, tegmen, the sheepfold, Arabic, con, concer. There you get the concer, okay? So it's cancer. It's actually concer. So the claw, the eye, the donkey, the donkey, and Tegman is the cover. So I think it's kind of like your shield. Okay, so here they have it as uh, the emblem of immortality in the form of a dung beetle. It was uh, called the Kyria, Kyria cattle folds. So Tegman was the brightest of the stars. It means the sheltering, the hiding place, the holding. Okay, so that was all the hexagon on the right-hand side of the Golden Gate. And this is the left-hand side of the Golden Gate, which is where all the birds are, um, and the Summer Triangle, and the Cygnus Cross. And I'm going to go all into all that now and explain into more detail um, all, all that symbolism. In ge geometry, if you take a cross, you can bring that into a cube. And Cygnus is a cube. Okay, so Cygnus that looks like the cross of Jesus Christ, right? Um, and it also, um, in Arabic, it was just, it's like the hen, the hen's beak. Um, it's, what did it say here? It said that, um, yeah, the hen's beak, the beak star, um, it's just, yeah. And then they called it Ario, which is like represents an iris, but the Ario, I always think of the Ario cookie, right? You know, it's like the black and white cookie. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. It just came to my head. And of course, it's the swan, right? It's the, the beautiful swan. You turn into the swan from the ugly duckling. It's called the Northern Cross. Cygnus, it relates to King Cygnus. Um, and, um, you know, this whole mythos of, you know, somebody being turned into a swan and everything. But when I got into this king thing, it's not called Cygnus, it's Cygnus. And there's a whole bunch of kings all related to being a swan. So the mythos of Cygnus is also related to Stamphalian birds. And uh, yeah, I wanted to go into that and I checked that out. And they're all about birds that have metal beaks. And um, you don't want to be, you know, pecked by them. And you need cloth on you, like a fleece, so that the beak gets stuck in the fleece and you don't get pecked to death, basically. That's all the symbolism there. And it actually relates to Pokemon. Can you believe that? That's like crazy. So, um, yeah, so I looked into this, the star Deneb, and it was called Os Rosa, which was Rosamund in German. Um, and it's uh, Rosamund in German is means horse or protection. So this whole root, you know, all the stars mean protect, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, have a, it's all for ascension. The left hand's path is, everything is for ascension. That's what all the stars mean. But don't get confused. Right hand of God is your left hand because you're in, at a mirror at when you get to the gates. So, yeah, th that's where the little trick comes in. Now, in Chinese um, mythology, there is the altar, which is part of the, um, summer uh, triangle and vega and they get joined together 
okay so which makes a bridge with the Milky Way um, and then it's the love that joins them so yeah I think you know it's really all about love is the is the summer triangle and let's not forget who was sitting on a big white swan with his bare feet for ascension back in the 80s you know this uh the symbolism is like everywhere and this is the american north american nebula um looks exactly like an eagle to me beautiful which happens to be in cygnus constellation so when i was googling cube i found this cube movie um and the man that was killed in the mysterious cube shaped room um it was developed by the lion's gate one of them um he woke up in another room and never met the other ones so you can see there's like more than one cube it seems like in the symbolism of it and then they have the zero cube and the zero cube uh, the slogan is there must be a way there must be an exit okay so yeah there is an exit you just have to know which path to take Okay, so this is the exact minute of the, you know, when the star is in the Ascension star, Zavi Java. Um, and then you have the sun right in the Golden Gate. And we have the, you know, the, the spear that, you know, the arrow that you take to kill the, the beast that's the dragon, the, the scorpion tail. Then you have your shield, which is um, um, Sertum. Um, and then you go um, through all the birds. Now the birds are trying to peck the flesh off you, which is what I found out in Mythos. Okay, so we're going to talk about Vega now, which is one of this is the top star. Um, this used to be the uh, pole star at one time, or it's going to be again, um, and it's the most important star uh, besides the sun. It's like it has uh, super importance in it. Here's a map showing of, you know, which stars are the pole star as time goes around. And I put the arrow there. That's that's uh, Vega right there. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting how the pole star, you know, shifts around all the time through time. Okay, so now we have Altair, um, the other star that is in um, the constellation Altair. Um, so... Here we have, it's the eagle, right? The altar, it looks like an eagle. Um, it also has that mythos that I talked about with the two lovers, the Chinese with the weaver girl. Um, and then, what else did it have here? It had something else that was really interesting. Oh yeah, it had the river drum, the drum. This drum is interesting because it relates to sound, right? So, yeah, and then these other people said it was the pillar of heaven, the star. Anyhow, so the sound thing fascinates me because it has to do with um, the constellation Lyra um, being the harp, and it has to do with the sirens. So I'm going to get into that, but yeah, so just think of that. It, this star happens to be the drum. I don't know if you guys remember that series called The V back in the 80s where they, those reptilians came. It, that show freaked me out. And that star is all around it. Humanoids evolved from an insect uh, who was a home planet revolved around Altair. And it's also the star of hope. So, yeah, so this uh, Altar eagle has this needle in its mouth or a pin or a spear. And they called it Ashsam. It's like Shazam, you know? like It's like, yeah, Shazam, you disappear. Um, so, anyhow, I just find it weird because there's that other um, needle you know chisel called uh, callum which is on the other path you know and that you know I figured out was all related to the Q symbolism is the needle okay so yeah the bird flies away with the needle you know runs off with it so right in the center of the summer triangle is Valpecchia which is the little fox and and he used to be um, holding a goose in his mouth the Fox song, this was a song when I was a kid. I, I, this song really, you know, I was so attached to this song. Um, so, yeah, it's the Fox. And then they had this crazy as a Fox show. And I couldn't believe it when I started looking into the episodes and all the symbolism of some of the, the, the names of the shows. Here's one like uh, Fox Dead or Alive, Burn Tip, Fox Hunt, Fox in Wonderland, um, Fox and the Wolf. Hyde, like Hyde, like Jekyll and Hyde, and see, like, just crazy. I, you know, the symbolism's everywhere.
Okay, so it's also called the answer, the star. Okay, and here he is holding the goose in his mouth. And I thought that was interesting about the golden goose and, um, you know, the Trumps at the White House, they have at Easter, it's always about the golden eggs. So I think that whole mythos about the golden eggs and the goose is coming from this center of this summer triangle and the fox. It also has a nebula called the Dumbbell Nebula right on its back leg, also known as the Apple Core Nebula. Um, yeah, there it is. It's quite pretty. It's also the first nebula ever discovered. Now, the other constellation that's really important is this Lyra constellation. It has a ring nebula in it. It's right by Vega. Um, and you can see it here in this old map. It's... Um, it's quite interesting because I'm starting to think this ring and the harp um, has relations to do with the sirens, the sound of the sirens. You don't want to hear them. And there's this old mythos where you play the harp and so you can't hear the sound of the sirens. And also has the ring nebula in it, like the Lord of the Ring. So I'm like, whoa. Okay, so here you got the eagle with the pin, you the fox, you get to the be the swan which is the end of the summer triangle is Deneb, which is right beside that little round circle there is uh, Cygnus X1. But then you see this constellation called uh, Cepheus, which is the king. And he has a hook with this like like rip reptile on it. So I was trying to look at this and I'm going, okay, i got to do some digging on this. And I was quite fascinated what I found. The constellation Lacerta um is the flying serpent. It, this is Beta Lassiter, the, the actual star. So yeah, it relates to the flying serpent and uh, the, it, this it also goes back to the Bible, okay? Um, and the serpent that's on a stick that Moses put on the stick. Okay, so this is interesting in this um, different Bible versions of what the serpent was made of. One was bronze, one was brass. Um, 1899 edition was brazen. So is brazen, somebody had said, you know, in another Bible that it's copper. So the Druids say that you need to burn blue in Ascension and copper uh, in your blood, you know, more copper in your blood makes you be more blue. Um, the crab, uh, there's certain aspects of the crab um, that if you eat a lot of crab, you, you get this chemical that that is more has more copper in it. Um, so yeah, I'm starting to think that the copper version is really the right version. So basically, the fiery serpent is um, Kundalini. You know, you got to be able to control it. It's the reptile. It's the snake. It's the you've got to be able to make it burn so it rises from the ashes and it transforms into something positive. Um, ride the dragon, if you want to see it as a fiery serpent as the dragon, you got to be able to ride the dragon. It's all that mythos is all there um, exactly in this constellation. So the star on the left hand shoulder of Cepheus is Alduramin. Um And this star actually is the... Um, the flock star, the flock stars of the flock, the celestial hook. It's also a huge giant red giant star. Here's a cool map of all the different stars and you know the sizes of them and what they are. I find that fascinating. And did you know like a Sirius B is a white dwarf? Um, but did you know that white dwarfs can turn back on, uh, relating to black holes and stuff? So. I find that really weird. And then you got this, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I'm starting to think is that Snow White Dwarf, you know, with the black hole. And I don't know, the whole mythos, everything that seems to be in our mythos and nursery rhymes and stuff all seems to relate to the sky. More and more you learn, the more and more you realize it. So it's like we're in a total illusion with our whole reality. That's how it seems to me anyhow. Yeah, and then supernova is, is an important link to the argument of dark energy. We're in an amazing time to be alive. So um, I've had this little clip here all talking about black holes and the sound they make. It makes like a drum sound. 
Um, and this relates to the sirens and hearing the sounds of the sirens and not getting like hypnotized by the sound of the sirens. So I just wanted to let you hear a scientist talk about this sound and they're explaining it before I sign out of here. Black holes can bang on space-time like mallets on a drum. And they have a very characteristic song. Imagine two black holes that have lived a long life together. At the end of their lives, they're going around each other, crossing thousands of kilometers in a fraction of a second. As they do so, they leave behind in their wake a ringing of space, an actual wave on space-time. Space squeezes and stretches as it emanates out from these black holes banging on the universe. Those are the gravitational waves and are literally the sounds of space ringing. And they will travel out from these black holes at the speed of light as they ring down and coalesce to one spinning quiet black hole. If you were standing near enough, your ear would resonate with the squeezing and stretching of space. You would literally hear the sound. Imagine a lighter black hole falling into a very heavy black hole. The sound you're hearing is a light black hole banging on space each time it gets close. As it falls in, it gets faster and it gets louder. Okay, the whole mythos of the sirens, okay, is that uh, you don't want to hear their sounds. And they talk about that the sounds um, are seducing. And they bring you to the, the Argonauts, you know, I guess were the ones that were going to go on the Argonaut ship, which, is, which, which was the ship constellation Carina, which was called Argonauts, um, the Argo ship, sorry. Um, you know, they had this whole mythos where they tied their, their captain to the post and then he couldn't get hypnotized and walk there. And there's other mythos of um, putting wax in your ears. I've also read about, you know, you playing music so that you can't hear the sound. And I think that's where Lyra comes into, um, you know, the whole mythos of the constellation Lyra in the summer triangles. So it's really fascinating when you hear scientists start talking about there's like this sound frequency coming from this black hole and then they're talking about this black hole that's in you know the cube that's which is the winter triangle which is on the, the, the you know the hammer you know so I'm kind of like okay is it the black hole is like the drum and then they're gonna be you know the symbolism is the hammer going on the drum like she said it sounds like a drum beating so there's all these little things that you know the symbolism is all there so I find that all fascinating. It's really important that, you know, you understand this. So in case there is some weird sound that you don't get hypnotized by, you know what to do. That's the whole reason I'm putting all this together is just so that we kind of have a sense of empowerment by knowing what to do instead of just kind of like hoping for the best, you know. Um, and then you have a little bit more control of your destiny. So, and you can pick the path and try to stay calm through the whole procedure. So. I'm going to leave you with Juan Osevan's uh, little little comment here that he has about where they want us to go, and also something that he wrote. And I found this uh, a little fascinating because there's a typo in it, and I just want you to be aware of the typo and read it as if the typo was um, put in there on purpose. In the brave new world, one believes things because one has been 
conditioned to believe them. Don't forget who and where you are. Come back to reality and breathe the fresh air. Do not attempt to adjust the your set. Is it your set or the set? It can't be adjusted. It's fixed. Yeah, we're on a fixed timeline. Reject and turn off the magician's illusions. This world is not real. Separate yourself from the misrule and the brainwashed masses. The only way to win is to not play their games. There is work to do and there is not much time. So yeah, we're on a timeline and there's going to be a window opening and you have to kind of know how to get through this window through ascension. This is the only way. It's, you, it's, it's basically follow Jesus. Jesus was teaching ascension. So um, I just hope that we all uh, have enough knowledge to, uh, to be able to find that window. It's this brotherhood of the snake. This is, this is a type of true evil. You know, a lot of people, they, they talk almost tritely about evil, but the reality is there is a depth of evil when you realize the real hate that's there, this, uh, this real hellish perspective. And people underestimate the magnitude of that hate, um, you know, a pure evil, uh, and you're dealing with it as though it's just a Hollywood version of uh, it's just a bad guy or something like that. No, the, the hate is to take you to hell for eternity. In, uh, it's also to in destroy your, your entire culture and your cultural memory and, and the memory of your land and your people and your tribe. And it isn't just of the Jewish people. It's of every tribe. The hell that they want us in is AI smart cities basically if this event happens and not enough people ascend um, they will be able to have a rebirth of their structure um, and start this whole kind of lockdown um, into smart cities and that's really going to be the turning point if there's enough people that have ascended and they can't control us anymore because we don't play their game um, this will be the beginning of the brave new world